Hello, how are you doing today? I am here to talk about climate, um, taking climate action in the city of Charleston. My name is Christine and I am uh, a, an ambassador with the city of Charleston uh, for the climate action plan. I'm here today because the earth is warming and Charleston could be underwater due to this warming. I think that stinks and I'd like to help prevent it. So today we're going to talk about the impacts of climate change in Charleston, climate action, um, the actual climate action plan that was created and what you can do to help. How is our planet warming? Uh, most of the radiation um, that comes into our planet. Well, let's see, let me go back. Solar radiation in the form of light waves passes through the atmosphere. Uh, most of the radiation is absorbed by the Earth and warms it. Some energy is radiated back into space uh, by the Earth and forms infrared waves. Uh, it is um, some of that infrared radiation is trapped in the atmosphere. That's that blue thin line that you're seeing. So as it's trapped, it warms the planet. And um, warming is not a bad thing. We, we like having a warm planet. We like being warm, but when we add greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, what we're doing is we're building up uh, the that that layer. It's it's acting like a blanket. It's keeping in those infrared rays. Uh, it's keeping in the CO2 and the greenhouse gases, and, and it's warming up our entire globe. Our, our entire atmosphere is warmer than it used to be, and this causes all manner of problems, as we will see. So as a prime example, burning fossil fuels, uh, that's, you know, we burn that for energy, but when we burn that, we're putting the CO2 into the environment. And again, that's acting like the blanket. Jay Inslee has said that uh, we are the first generation to feel the sting of climate change, and we are the last generation that can do something about it. So this is smoke from the Australian fires that happened in 2020. The smoke actually reached all the way around the globe. In 2020 also, monsoon rainfall in Bihar, uh, India was 50% higher than usual, and it led to the deaths of um, 1,900 people. In Ashland, Oregon, more than 2,300 homes had burned um, in the fires uh, from September 2020. And since then, we have seen even more fires in California, Colorado, Washington, Oregon. Uh, the West is definitely um, having more and more fires every year. And we can see that in the numbers of um, how many catastrophes uh, we're having across the globe. You know, Germany had, um, Germany and Europe, um, most of Europe had devastating floods, as we saw the Australian wildfires. Constantly, um, we're in this cycle, it seems, of um, always having a weather catastrophe, be it fire, hurricanes, storms, mudslides. It's more and more every year, and it and it's hard to say that. I mean, now we almost all know somebody who has been through a catastrophe uh, because it's so prevalent. Now human drivers are the red line and those are the um, the CO2 and the other greenhouse gases that that we are contributing to the atmosphere and then the blue line are that's the natural drivers that's things like uh, volcanic activity or solar activity like we we're talking about those infrared rays that come into the um, planet and they add, you know, natural warmth and, and, and a good amount of warmth to the planet. And, and it's a, a stabilizing warmth. 
all these other uh, human and natural um, drivers combined um, are causing uh, the actual temperature of the whole planet to rise, as you can see in that um, red area of this graph. Now this is the observed sea level rise in our own Charleston Harbor. It's been over a foot in the last hundred years, and, and we can see that uh, just by you know the flooding that we see on our own roads. Uh, these these red lines are the potentially inaccessible roads uh, that if we had a hundred year flood, and we have had a hundred year flood, so we all know that um, our roads are impassable on occasion. Uh, the sea level rise, even on a sunny day, you know, we've got high tides coming into downtown Charleston, so we all know this is a problem. Some of these uh, pictures, these are showing you what could happen if we had a storm that was similar to Hugo, except it was hitting at high tide. So this is the crosstown and you can see that the city of Charleston is completely underwater um, in this area. This is looking at the Medical University, um, some hotels, uh, restaurant there. This is bat the Battery, White Point Garden, um, looking towards King Street. Uh, you know, the entire city there is underwater. This is on Broad Street. That would be the city, um, the Cathedral of St. John the Baptist. And this is over on Adger's Wharf. I do see one parking lot in this photo that is not flooded, but the rest of it um, is actually white capping. So let's talk about what we can do about all this with the Climate Action Plan. The city's Climate Action Plan, it, um, it's a five-year strategic plan. It, uh, is in the areas of buildings, transportation, uh, waste, and carbon sinks. It reflects the latest science. It aligns with industry standards. It aligns with other city of Charleston plans, and it emphasizes the importance of ongoing equitable community engagement. All right, some uh, of our communities are um, historically underserved and underrepresented and underrepresented and they're at risk uh, more so than other communities. Uh, we need to have a climate action plan that uh, is centered on equity and ensures both the benefits and the challenges of climate action are shared equitably among all community members. So we did a lot to reach out to the community. There were over a thousand members of the community involved. There were over 150 people that volunteered to be on working groups. And uh, in those working groups, there were over 30 meetings. A lot of this happened during COVID um, when we were all at home, working from home and not able to get out to public meetings. So most of these meetings were online. Um, and uh, the community was really there. They really stepped. Ste ste they really were um, stepping up. A and it's a community plan for the community by the community. And we want to thank everyone that did come out to those meetings, or uh, answered a questionnaire, or um, you know sent emails to get other people to help. Uh, we really appreciate everyone's time. All right. The Climate Action Plan has 51 action items. We can't go over all of those today, but we will tell you, um, we will go over action items in each of the sections. Uh, buildings has 25% of the action items. Transportation has 33%, waste has 20%, and carbon sinks has 22%. Their co-benefits of these action items. So, you know, that we're going to reduce the carbon, but we're also going to do a lot of other things. We're going to beautify. We're going to save money. We're going to increase safety. These uh, action items were chosen because they had so many co-benefits. 
These action items will help us reduce our emissions target our emissions. We do have targets. Um, we have uh, measured the climate, the um, carbon for the city of Charleston as a whole and for the city of Charleston as a government, just the buildings that the city of Charleston runs itself and the automobiles and any emissions that are related to just running city government. So we want to get um, to net zero emissions by 2050 and we want to have a 56% reduction by 2030. So we've got a midterm goal and then a long term goal. And as you can see, the city of Charleston government with the orange um, bars. It pales in comparison to the carbon amount um, produced by the entire city. So we really do need everyone's help. The city of Charleston cannot do this by itself uh, because they simply don't create the lion's share of the carbon emissions. All right, so in the climate action plan, there is a, um, a full page of action items that you can do on your own. Uh, it is the last page of the climate action plan. We encourage you to go online um, to the city of Charleston's website and look up the climate action plan and get this sheet of get the sheet, put it on your refrigerator, uh, you know, try to pick off one item a month uh, and really, you know, do your part to help reduce carbon emissions. All right, so what are some of the things that uh, the city of Charleston and its citizens can do? When we're talking about carbon sinks, we're talking about things like trees and plants. They, um, they they soak up carbon they take it up out of the atmosphere they're a sink so we want to put the right tree in the right place city of charleston in particular downtown uh you know planting a tree on the city sidewalk is um you've got to really put the right tree there so that it doesn't grow up into the electric wires uh, also um, west ashley or james island or other you know it's it we've got to work with um, our homeowners associations we've got to work with the dominion uh, there's a lot of um, reasons to try to um, put the right tree in the right place so uh, there is a charleston street tree program they will help you plant trees and uh, they will suggest the right type of tree and how to take care of it. We also, um, we should be reducing our waste. We don't want to be wasteful with the amount of food that we purchase. We want to eat all of our food, but when we do have food left over, we want to compost it. Uh, there are uh, av resources available online. The city of Charleston now has a um, drop off um, program in place for compost and that is on the city of Charleston's website as well. So go to the city of Charleston sustainability page and you will be able to find information on composting. All right, uh, that program did just start uh, in January of 2020. And uh, the city of Charleston uh, has has had a restaurant um, composting program in place uh, and there are other um, businesses in the city of Charleston that will come by and pick up your compost if you have a lot. Um, so want to reach out to those businesses to pick up your composting and get it out to Bees Ferry Landfill and the um, county's composting program. So how can we be more resilient to all this flooding? There are things that we as individuals can do. We can adopt a storm drain. Uh, if you have a storm drain near your house, you know, make sure that, you know, all these needles from pine trees and leaves from your yard and other waste um, are not clogging that storm drain. Uh, you can report clogged storm drains to be cleaned out. Uh, so how does that benefit you? It reduces flooding, pollution, and it helps beautify the area. 
We want to make your home more resilient by putting in rain gardens, rain barrels. Um, you can divert water away from your home uh, and it will not only beautify your landscape with a rain garden, uh, but it'll make it safer for your home. What can you do about transportation? Well, there's a Holy Spokes bike share downtown. Those bikes are actually uh, going to be upgraded very soon to be electric bikes. There will be a new company that will be managing the bike share very soon. Hopefully uh, we will be seeing more information about that uh, in this brand new year we've got going on. Uh, so get out there and, and ride an electric bike. Give it a try. It is, I've, I've done it before. It's a lot of fun. And uh, you could actually look up CARTA. CARTA has all types of buses. Um, they have buses that you can actually put bikes on if you want to put your own bike on a bus and ride downtown or ride wherever and, and have a nice um, bike ride. Uh, you can walk uh, more often, get some exercise, improve your health. Uh, it's there. There are a lot of different ways that we can contribute to reducing our transportation footprint. All right, so energy is a, a biggie. We all use energy. Um, some of us use energy all day long. Uh, you know, I'm sitting in an office with lights right now. That's using energy. How do we um, reduce the amount of energy we use. Well, we can have LED lighting instead of in, in, um, incandescent or fluorescent lighting. The LED lights save so much energy and they save so much money. So if you, ha if you haven't changed your lights yet, uh, please look into changing your lights to LED light bulbs. That, that'll be a big one for you. Smart thermostats can help. You can set the thermostat to um, go up a few degrees or down a few degrees when you're not in the home. That can save you a lot of energy as well. And um, reach out, reach out to your, your energy company for a lot of uh, really good information. They can, they, they've got all kinds of tips on their websites, uh, Dominion and Berkeley Electric both. So reach out find this information and and act on it and you will not only save energy but you will save money all right so sustain your lifestyle uh, we know from all sorts of data that the uh the supply chain it it has been We've all become way more involved with the supply chain this year, right? Because as we know, when we go to the grocery store, sometimes we're not seeing what we want in the grocery store. Uh, in the supply chain, there's so many different parts of it. There's everything from how we're using the land to what's being grown on a farm to what's being given to animals for their feed. All, you know, that's only part of it. Then, you know, once once you get the head of lettuce or the tomatoes and and you want tomato sauce, it's going to go to a factory. It's going to be processed. It's got to be transported. A lot of our fruits and vegetables come from other countries. They come from this country, but all the way across the country. Uh, each section of this supply chain takes energy. So let's look at that. When we're looking at what types of food we eat that take the most amounts of energy, it looks like beef is the number one energy consuming um, product on the market today. Uh, part of that is um, in this green line, you can see it's the land use that they, that they um, it takes a lot of land to produce one cow. And, and that's more land than any other product on in our food system. Chocolate is actually a, a second to that. <laughs> um, so, you know, who knew that chocolate took so much land to produce? Um, and 
the other thing about um, beef is that the cattle are ruminants. So their stomach turns their food and they put out a lot of gases. Those gases, gases are methane gases and they're pretty potent greenhouse gas. So that's, that's the other reason that um, beef is so high um, on the carbon um, scale. And uh, what's low on the carbon scale? Well, nuts are actually a negative, as you can see from this graph. Olive oil is slightly negative, um, but we're not going to live off nuts and olive oil. So what we need to do is just sort of try to eat lower on this carbon um, chain uh, of, for the um, supply chain. We, we need to eat more fruits. We need to eat more vegetables, more grains. Um, and actually happens that this is the, the healthier diet um, for you. So eating lower on the carbon um, scale is actually eating better for you. So if you sustain your lifestyle, you will eat more plant-based, um, you'll reduce your uh, consumption of meat and dairy, uh, and eat more local vegetables or more vegetables and fruit at all, period. There are free recipes online. Uh, there are vegan restaurants in the Charleston area. You can give it a try. Uh, you could institute a Meatless Monday uh, on your own home. Uh, try our farmer's markets. They have a lot of good local produce. They actually have local meat that is produced. Uh, and, and if you're going to eat meat, if you eat it locally, then you're taking out a lot of that supply chain. You're not having it transported across the country and that sort of thing. So we just need to be a little more aware of what we're eating and, and where it comes from. All right, so we wanna shift our mindset, right? That takes, um, just change our habits. And I didn't know that, you know, it takes 20,000 liters of water to make one shirt and one pair of pants. That's a lot of water. So, and those are cotton. Cotton does take a lot of water to grow the cotton. And that's one of the reasons why it's only grown in certain parts of the world. Um, so we were moving away um, from, you know, always consuming and consuming and consuming. Do we need, um, three closets full of clothes? Probably not. Um, so let's, you know, buy clothes that last and, and really work on making our clothes last. You know, we don't have to be fashion plates every single day of the week. Um, and I think uh, COVID actually, um, when that happened, a lot of people just stayed at home and, and um, put on their comfortable clothes and, and we're actually happier. Uh, so, you know, have a clear vision of what you want your future to look like and then make your purchases based on that. I hope you've gotten some ideas today. Uh, you know, trying one thing at a time, take those smaller steps. Um, the city of Charleston can't do this by themselves. They they really need the help of every single <coughs> citizen, every single business. Uh, we encourage you to just get out there, um, get online, learn more, uh, join a group, uh, join a club, um, find out more about healthier actually um, things that you can do for for yourself and for other people there is a website it's uh charles at the charleston um, city government uh sustainability uh get out there uh talk with your neighbors talk with your friends uh you could become a climate ambassador uh, we've got a lot of resources online uh, that Facebook and, and Instagram as well. And commit to taking at least one action. Uh, you can commit to taking that action today. Uh, you can sign there's a pledge online also at the City of Charleston Sustainability website. Uh, there's a um, you can 
use the QR code with your smartphone to pull up that pledge. You are part of the solution. You are incredibly important to climate action planning uh, for the city of Charleston, for the state of South Carolina, and for the world. Everything that you can do does matter. Uh, so if please join us. Uh, we really appreciate um, you listening today. I want to thank you for your time and uh, hope you have a great uh, 2020. Two. <laughs> I can't believe it's 2022. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Bye bye.